thank you, Carl, um, for that presentation. Um, so right now, as I mentioned earlier, we have a presentation and we have a panel. And it's not just any other panel. We have a powerhouse cast of global health leaders joining us this afternoon. Um, and I'd like to start um, uh, by inviting on stage um, Global Fund former executive director and one of the founding architects of PEPFAR and also the vice chancellor of the University of Global Health and Rwanda's former health minister. Please join me on stage, Mark Daibul and Agnes Binaguaho. Okay, we're, we're having a okay. situation right now. <laughs> Oops. Oops. Whoop. Oh, it's gonna be. It's a high one. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you very there much. You I'm very honored. <laughs> so, um, thank you so much for being with us here this afternoon. Um, so, I'll get right to it. Putting patients first um, when designing health programs. In global health, we all know that's what we should be doing, but. Um, is that what's currently happening? Anyone would like to take first? Minister? I'm no longer minister, <laughs> but before being minister, being minister, and now after, I can say no. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not what is done generally. Let me tell you the example of HIV. I am not going to say it was not good. <laughs> because it brought money to the health sector. But it brought money to fight a virus, not for the well-being of the people, unfortunately. Like, we, know we, we need the four S for creating a health system. We need the space, the staff, equipment, and everything. We need the, um, a system. Space, staff, stuff, and system. And we don't need money that go just in one direction. Of course, we are not going to blame. If the money comes, you take it vertically and you're horizontalizing when it's in the country. But in the beginning, 2000, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, it was a nightmare and a fight with the donors. What's your take on that, Mark? Um, I think it's complicated. The, the general answer is no, unless you're the provider. So at the community level, the focus is on the person because that's who's in front of them. Um, we kind of mess it up by trying to uh, force a different approach, but of course the provider is focused on the person. That doesn't mean they always have everything they can bring for the person. But it's not just health. I mean, they, if we're really talking about health, not disease, whether it's HIV or diabetes or hypertension, if we're talking about health, um, it's not just medical intervention, it's a much broader approach. It's actually a person and prevention, and we don't do anything on prevention really, even at the community level, because there's not a lot of resource or knowledge on that. And if you want to just look at HIV, I mean, we're at the highest risk of losing control of the HIV epidemic we have ever been, despite all the progress, because we're not reaching young people, we're not um, understanding them, they're not interested in the programs we're providing for them. Surveys show that they don't even care about HIV anymore. They don't think about HIV. They think about jobs. They think about um, reproductive health. They think about their community, their friends, their family. They think about what everyone else thinks about. So they're not interested in HIV, yet we keep trying to ram HIV programs down them. Where do you see the problem? Why? The problem is we have too many doctors involved in all of this, in part. Um, and the problem is it's complicated. So if you're talking about a young person's risk of HIV, that's a symptom of a much deeper social issue, whether it's a young girl that's being abused or whether it's a young boy that is in a cultural setting that is, is not telling him that abusing a girl is the wrong thing to do or the hierarchical structure related to boys and girls. They could be out of school because of financial issues. They could be driven into trying to seek resources through sex because they have to. So it's, it's a much more complicated picture. It's about education, it's about societal norms, it's about everything. And so this is a symptom of a vulnerability, but we go after the, vulner the piece that we know because we're technical. Um, and so really the community is the solution. You have to get the community involved because they know the problems and they generally come up with solutions. We used to do that in health. We used to uh, 
give the community the ability to respond, but the financing, the structures, the, tech, the technocrats, uh, it's, it's very, these are complicated issues. It's easier to be technical than it is to be anthropological. Mm -hmm. You mentioned structures, and Agnes was saying about the earlier years of, of global health. Um, a lot of the programs we have right now are structured vertically, and, and, and that includes Global Fund, PEPFAR. Do we, do we um, need new institutions that will veer away from that kind of structure and take in, you know, to, to, um, to, to kind of cover a more holistic picture of what patients' needs are? What would that look like? So, you know, so how would you do that? We thought we were doing that. You know, the institutions were created with big boards, with civil society and everyone involved. Uh, there's no way to do that, and in, in, at least if you're trying to think about global. And what I would say is let's stop thinking about creating global institutions and start talking about how do we support the people in the country to achieve the objectives, starting with the community. There is no global institution that's going to solve this problem. And by the time we finish, the political nightmare would be to create it. The countries will have solved it on their own anyway, and they'll have, we're not going to have much development money. I mean, within the next 10 to 15 years, we're not going to have development money externally. It's going to be coming broad, largely from the countries, except in a very few places. So why, rather than doing all that, why don't we start focusing on how do we support not global conversations, not global institutions, but starting local and figuring out how in a country you support getting services to local people, uh, empowering, I mean, whatever the word might or might not mean, the community and the people in it to solve the problems and layer in the support from there. It's the only way to do it. If we, we will not solve it with a new institution. We will not solve it with a new global effort. We'll only solve it by supporting the communities. What's your take on that, Agnes? Or we can solve it uh, more quickly by putting all the existing global institutions at service of development. Because it's health, but it's only working if you use all the bullets you have to break the cycle of disease and poverty. Hmm? Uh, uh, more among the, the most vulnerable. So, uh, Create new institution? No, I think a new philosophy of supporting countries to fight diseases. Hmm? Here, I, I and understand. support people, not just fight disease. That means when you fight diseases, you have to go for the, the social determinant of health as a whole. Because if the person has everything and no transport to go and get the medicine, the person have nothing. Or if the person have expensive drugs to, to, to treat uh, HIV or uh, cancer and die be because of a mosquito and malaria, this is a nonsense. So it's a holistic approach. Moving toward that, what you, you, you both are mentioning, we also need you know, global health leaders who are going to have to think that way. And I know in your school, you're training future generation of global health leaders. Um, how many students do you have right now? 48. 48. We start the medical education in one year from now. <laughs> um, I wonder how you train them, especially when they go out in the real world currently and they face bureaucracies, institutions that have been doing the same thing for so long, and how do, do they break into that? We train them to, first of all, strategic thinking, and that sky is the limit. They need to learn how to advocate and to deal with their bosses, their colleagues, and also the people they are leading. We give techniques on how to, to put everybody around the table. The best way and the best approach is the consensus approach. We should not fight each other. Remember the time where we were fighting uh, for condom and the religious were against, while the religious, religious give a lot of care in the country. So we have to put everybody consensually around patient care, etc. So by teaching this approach, we help them to deal in their day-to-day -day work. But also... But you're telling also them that this is what you're going to face in the real world. Absolutely. Because we give real example. We, we teach by case, case study. We tell the story of this gentleman. And we tell the story of fo so many of, of us who have fought because not understood at that time. And yesterday it was HIV. 
Yesterday afternoon it was HPV. Today it's cancer. It will be always something that it's not accessible for everybody when it's not true. But they're the ones who will solve this, right? So if you were expecting people, mostly of the age in this room, to fix this problem, we're not going to do it. There's a great ancient Roman saying, there's hope in death. We need this generation to pass on because this new generation does think differently. There are things like Barbara Bush's Global Health Corps. People are thinking different. When they're connected in different ways. Uh, the technology and what's available can lead to a different approach. Uh, there's a different... If you, if you go and talk to young people in Rwanda, they think fundamentally differently. They think in a coherent way. We need to give them the space, which is why I say don't create another organization. Let's identify, support the people who will figure out this solution that we can't possibly solve because we're, there's n as much as we'd like to, we will never get out of the institutions and the thought processes of people our age. So let's get the people who can, not only train, but get them involved now because they'll figure out solutions as long as we give them the latitude to do it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And involve, when we teach, we involve them with local leaders, national leaders, community mm -hmm. leaders, yeah. and the... They are educated at community level. Mm -hmm. That's why we are in rural north. Okay. I'm just going to hold that point because I want to bring in our two other panelists t today. Um, I want to um, invite on stage the Managing Director of the Global Cancer Treatment from the American Cancer Society and the CEO of AMREF Health Africa, the largest African-led international organization in the continent. Please join us on stage, Meg O'Brien and Githinji Gitahi. I'm the only one had a problem, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to bring in the discussion in the private sector. Um, and I want to hear from all of you, what role do you see the private sector playing in transforming the current models that we have and ushering in that era of, you know, a more patient-centered healthcare? Any one of you would like to start? Well, um, first we were, we were standing out there with Meg and we were feeling really excluded. We were watching, <laughs> and that's how exclusion feels. We had this, this missing out fear. Um, I think for, for me, when we talk about healthcare uh, specifically, because that's, that's what we are discussing, there are multiple sectors that are of social importance. You know, you can talk about energy, water, education, health. But in many areas in most of these countries, when you talk about energy, for example, you know, we don't give energy to everybody. You know, we, even people who cannot afford to pay bills, they don't get energy. That's, that's the, uh, the reality of it. Education, you know, it's not too difficult. Again, you can say we'll provide to everyone. The quality really may be neither here nor there. Healthcare is where it's extremely sensitive in terms of who do you give it to because you have to give it to everybody because it is an extremely sensitive issue. And therefore, that is where we find that private sector entry is a bit more of a complex discussion than in other areas like energy and uh, water and uh, different areas. So for me, my view is this, that private, uh, you know, the healthcare and specifically universal health coverage is a pro-poor agenda. The people who need universal health coverage are the poor and they need it because they are poor. The rich need it too, but the people who need it most are the poor. And therefore that comes, brings kind of a platform for discussion of the engagement of the health of the of private sector to ask what would be the incentive of private sector participating in a proper agenda and what would that incentive be? And I know, and I, you know, I have participated in uh, private sector discussions that there's a whole discussion about the bot double bottom line, you know, we want to do good, do well as we do good, all that discussion, but at the end of the day, there must be a market incentive to continue to create incentive for the private sector. So for me, the involvement of the private sector must be cautious and must be guided by a public health sector agenda where the roadmap is clearly, uh, is clearly defined, otherwise you may invite chaos. And that's what we've seen in some of the African countries where the uh, private sector has created chaos because government is looking for quick wins. And the private sector comes very quickly with quick wins. So, Extremely important engagement, but must be led by the public sector, and therefore we must strengthen the public sector to be able to lead that conversation. How do we get there, Meg? 
Well, I think we get there by, by recognizing the value that comes from each of the, of the private sector and, and the public sector. And let me tell you a story about a really great collaboration that actually worked. Um, we had at uh, the National Hospital in Kenya, Kenyatta National Hospital, a queue for radiotherapy treatment that was um, as much as six months and oftentimes out to 12 months. We had thousands of people in line for radiotherapy, but we weren't able to treat them because we didn't have capacity in the machine. We had private hospitals, four of them in Nairobi, that had radiotherapy machines that were only turned on one day a week because no one could afford to pay for them. The cost was $100 per session, and at the National Hospital it was $5. So we implemented a high-level subsidy, which is basically that we approached the private hospitals and we said, we're going to buy $50,000 of radiotherapy, but we'd like a 40% discount because this is a, a large volume for you. And what we were trying to do was to increase competition in the private sector. By the time we were done with that, all of the private hospitals had reduced their cost by 40%. And once that price came down, the National Health Insurance Fund was able to start covering radiotherapy. The result is that the wait time for radiotherapy at the public hospital is now one to two months. And I think this kind of example shows us that you know, the public sector alone cannot carry all of the health burden. And when there are people who are willing to pay for care in the private sector, developing a good partnership allows us to take some of the pressure off of the public system so that patients who can afford it can go to the private system. We can make that a little bit more efficient and competitive, but that frees up resources that allows people who are using the public system to, to use it better and to get better access yeah, to it. Getting to that discount. It's, 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 it's a difficult discussion. Um, when we talk about medicines today, everyone, you know, the call is to bring down the prices of medicine so it's accessible to everyone. You had this deal, right? Bringing down the prices of uh, 16 cancer drugs, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken, in six countries. I know I want to ask about what's the key um, uh, part of that deal, but I also want to ask, What's the toughest part in that discussion? Sure. So the key part of that deal I want to communicate is that it's, it was not a philanthropic deal. We made an, an agreement with Pfizer and CIPLA to reduce the cost of the 16 uh, cancer treatments that are on the essential medicines list. Um, we did this because we took a look at the market for chemotherapy in Africa, and it's very, very poorly functioning. So people pay too much money and they often get low quality products. Um, what I want to point out about this agreement, which has actually been expanded to 21 countries now, at least our agreement with CIPLA, which covers about 70% of cancer incidents in Sub-Saharan Africa, is that it, these are for-profit prices. So this is not a donation, it's not philanthropy, it's market shaping. And so it's also a two-way agreement, which means the prices are lower, partly because Pfizer and CIPLA are large companies that can offer lower prices, they have more efficient production. But it's an agreement, and we have an obligation on the other side, which is working to organize the demand side of the market. So we're working to connect buyers directly with sellers so that we cut out distributors along the way who add markups. Uh, we work with ministries of health to coordinate procurement so that instead of a lot of small orders or emergency orders, the procurements are coming in at sizes that match production runs so that it's less expensive for these suppliers to supply the market. And we're strengthening forecasting and planning so that there's a little bit more forward visibility these kinds of things reflect the fact that the price paid by the patient is not just the price that it leaves the supplier. There's a lot of other factors that are along the way where we can intervene to, to reduce kind of the price point for the This consumer. is a hugely important point. I mean, there's this mythology that if we just get generic companies or if companies just get it away, we'll get all... You have to have some profit, but, you know, as Andrew Witte used to say, I can make the same amount with one thing for $100 or 100 things for $1. So you've got to create the market structures that will allow for this. We did this at the Global Fund. That's how we reduced the price of uh, malaria products by 40, 60%. She was able to fill her gap because we were able to bring the prices down. But it's more complicated than just please give them to us for free. Or give them to It'll no. never happen. And we won't have everything. Could I just finish one, one, yeah. one piece of that is the, the private sector plays so many key roles here, but there's no reason, and we developed something called wambo.org when I was at, at the Global Fund, there's no reason we can't have a global buying pool for commodities for healthcare, mm -hmm. because that volume dictates price. Yeah. That's, it will always dictate price, plus forecasting, and mm -hmm. if you have a tool, so we built something that's basically like an Amazon.com for health commodities. 
the resistance to that is enormous. But any you there is no you could pool everything. You know, Mauritius could pool with with Rwanda, who could pool with um, uh, uh, Thailand around some commodities and you'll get a lower price and then everyone's seeing the prices and everyone's seeing How the competition. How much of that is currently happening? Well, we built it. Now all we need to do is get the resistance out of the system to allow it to move forward. But the resistance is enormous, including, by the way, from people on the far left who are saying, oh, this might undermine our ability to destroy intellectual property. Well, intellectual property is not going anywhere. So mm -hmm. uh, if you want to wait until intellectual property goes away, until we can have a coherent approach to reduce prices, maybe we should just stop. So people on the right, people on the left, it's insane. This is yeah. such a common sense approach. Yeah, I, I think the biggest challenge is actually prioritization. Because you see, private sector will come with what they want to offer and what they have to offer. If you have a pharma company, they'll come to the government and they'll offer what they can offer. But the government needs to take a step back before taking what's available to ask what do we need. And I think that's really the critical important question about what first do we need for this country? What do we need for Rwanda? What do we need for Kenya? Then after you define that priority, then you engage the private sector. I think the challenge now, and what I see with um, many of the private sector engagements in the country where I come from, is they come and they offer. And because the politicians want quick wins, they take it and they move forward. Then you ask the question, was that what was the priority? Despite the fact that this drug came at 50% discount, was that priority? Or would that money have gone to something else? We have so prioritization entities. Is an issue. We have global entities for that. Yeah. In Rwanda, for how the, do you God's balance sake, the... We have WHO. What is there for if not to do that? Why should people do the job of people that are highly paid with your taxes, my taxes, and taxes of the poor, because it's country cotization, that, and, and don't do the job. We have African Union, if we are in Africa. African Union have a directorate for health. What are they doing? Nothing. Okay, so <laughs> this is what we should do. Yeah. This is what we should w fight for. We should not let um, goodwill of people who have time in the Western world to, foc to concentrate on our problem, to solve our problem. We should solve that at home. And we have the capacity to do that. And we have people highly pay for that. How do you balance, you know, governments, they, all, they always want quick wins, also because of their constituents. Yeah. How do you balance that, quick wins, and making sure that, the, you know, while they're doing that, they're creating that roadmap to make sure that everyone is, is part of the plan and everyone is following that plan. How, don't <laughs> let them do something that is not sustainable. And what is the press doing? I'm happy to be here at DevEx <laughs> because there is a lot of yeah. press and I hope that they will echo that. It is duty, expose what is not right. Huh? And first of all, make them do their job. Secondly, make them do it well. And quick queen, we can have quick queen. There is a lot of quick queen. Yep. Quick queen with everything we have learned, even us the last 20 years, but even learning what others have learned before us. So we have no excuse. It's not so complicated and so complex. It's just bad will. No. I think, I think I just, you know, it's a really diverse discussion. I'd love to expand on this, but maybe each, and each one of you, can you, if you have one call to action to our audience right now regarding this issue. Um, Meg, you want to start? Well, I would say if you're working in health in sub-Saharan Africa and you're not thinking about cancer, it's time to start. Uh, we have more cancer deaths than we do deaths from uh, malaria or TB. And the World Health Organization is predicting that by the year 2030, so 12 short years, for every four deaths from HIV, there'll be three deaths from cancer. And yet our spending on cancer is about 3% of what we spend on HIV. So we are going to be racing to build the infrastructure that we need, and it's time to start building cancer treatment into global health. Yeah. For me, I would say actually that we should move away from defining what disease is countries need to focus on. We need to say that we need to start the population health and then build up and say what is needed from a population health need. And then it may be cancer, it may be vaccination, it may be, you know, depending on population health. And actually the challenge I find is because of so much uh, vertical interest, the government gets swayed to focus on what's most visible. I think the government needs to take a step back, and I think I must thank the government of Rwanda for what they did, say, wait a minute, these are our national priorities, this is our strategy, now come, let's engage. Until the government are able to do that, to create that priority, and then engage, everything is going to be chaotic. 
So for me, governments must take leadership, and we must build their capacity to take that leadership. Mark? Focus on young people. Um, that is where we're going to lose uh, not only HIV, but all disease. But focus on them as a person. Focus on them as, an oper as a, a person with potential. Focus on what their needs are and to support them for a productive, healthy life. And that will get us way past health. It'll get us way past individual diseases. It'll get us focused on what we need for human beings for the future and their potential. And if we do that, these problems will get worked out. If we don't do that, we're going to have a chaotic world, a very unsafe world, and one where solutions don't get solved, problems get created. Oh, so I am agree with Your uh, last words, yeah. uh, <laughs> my colleagues, and I will say create systems. Because if you create systems, it will take care about primary care, secondary care, and tertiary care, and be ready even for care of things we don't know yet. So create system, but don't forget that the four has are needed. Staff, stuff, space to create the system. And when you do that, you solve all those problems, and you are ready to grow in an harmonized manner to provide holistic care, patient-centered. I'd love to continue this discussion, and have us <laughs> but I would love to also um, hear some insights from our audience. Mm. I can see from here, Mr. John Yuko, Gen Secretary General of Rotary International. John, um, there's a lot of discussion right now on polio eradication, also on polio transition. Can you can you give us some insights on those discussions, and how do you see? Um, you know, the patient-centered um, approach that we're discussing right now fitting into that? Well, first of all, thank you, Jenny. Um, perhaps just two seconds on, on the history of polio eradication and how, how we got to where we are today. Um, back in 1979, Rotary, my organization, uh, was celebrating its 75th anniversary, and smallpox was getting eradicated, and uh, Rotary decided, well, why don't we try to begin vaccinating children against polio in, in the Philippines? And that effort was, was so successful that in 1985, uh, Rotary, a nonprofit, not a government agency, not a multilateral institution, not a ministry of health, uh, had the audacity, and I think that's the right word, the audacity to say, let's try to see if we can eradicate polio. Uh, three years later, in 1988, we were joined by the World Health Organization, CDC, and UNICEF, and we created the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, and about 10 years ago, joined by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We had 350,000 cases of polio back in 85 every year. 125 countries that were endemic. Uh, today, as I speak, we're down to just two countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan, where the virus uh, is still, the wild virus is still endemic, and we have 10 cases, eight in Afghanistan and two in Pakistan. So we've come a very, very long way from where we were. And I think there's two lessons that can be learned from this, this effort. One is the power of partnership. It's only because of the partnership between the five partner entities in GPI, plus governments, health ministries, and private sector actors that we've been able to get to where we are today. Everyone with their clear lane, clearly defined role, and a coordinated strategy. And I think the second lesson learned here is the power of civil society. There's really 1.2 million Rotarian citizen volunteers who had, again, the audacity to say, let's eradicate a disease from the, from the face of the earth. And so in terms of the discussion you're having today, I think the impact is, is very clear. No polio, a lot less kids coming, uh, putting pressure on the, on the, on the health systems. Uh, and this is, these are savings that can then be redeployed uh, for other, other uh, interventions and other diseases. Do you think the, you know, the whole discussion about moving toward a more patient-centered approach, is that going to help us to eradicate polio soon, or do you think that's going to maybe... Well, I mean, I think th there's a lot of talk now about, my God, you've only got 10 cases and you've still got to spend $7 billion to get to eradication. But um, as you know, Mark today at the malaria breakfast indicated, the closer you get to the end game, the more expensive it becomes on a per case, per case basis. And so we need to eradicate polio, I would say, for four reasons. One, the moral imperative. Um, you know, no child should ever have to suffer polio again as long as mankind exists. And if you take the, the economic value, if you can put one on a child not having polio and you take it out for the remainder of humanity and, and put some kind of conservative discount rate, the, the number is astronomical. Uh, secondly, we've already seen $27 billion in savings since 1985, healthcare savings due to the polio eradication effort. We're anticipating another $25 billion in additional savings through 2035. Third, we've already spent $15 billion. We've come so close, we need to get the job done. And finally, um, 
if you're interested in malaria, HIV, AIDS, TB, whatever it is, you're interested in polio. Because if we can demonstrate that it's possible to eradicate a disease like polio, which is complex, three different viruses, et cetera, et cetera, we set the stage for the next global health mm -hmm. initiative. Thank you, Jean. Thank you so much for that insight. I think um, I would like to acknowledge in our, in our audience also Mr. Michael Holscher from PSI. Michael, um, do you have any questions for our panel? I, I do, but first I want to thank you, Jenny, and the panel for a very stimulating, if not inspiring, conversation, a very thought-provoking. Um, we, we began with this opening presentation and the discussion reminding of us, us of the possibilities in healthcare when you, get, when you begin design and programming from the point of view of the consumer. And I think Mark even suggested that some of those solutions don't involve doctors. You might even make the case not all of them involve health facilities. But, and so we each see different possibilities in that. I guess my question, I'd, I'd welcome the panel's thoughts on whether the extent to which we could extend that value and that perspective to the issue of financing. Because so much of the early movement in domestic financing proceeds from policymakers and capitals who discuss things like capitation rates with, re, with respect to facilities and providers. And yet we know that, that real power comes when there's financial power and when there's resource power. So your thoughts on where you're seeing any uh, examples of efforts to get beyond clinics and providers when it comes to the issue of getting financial power in the hands of women to make choices for themselves. Mark, do you want to? Um, there are uh, a number of examples. Um, Farm Access, for example, has, a, uh, has an excellent program that is like basically crowdfunding within a family. So fam if a woman needs uh, to deliver, a family will actually raise resources and have it available on a chip, but, and when she needs to use it, it's available. But we have to go more than that. And you know, if you look out to where, what we need in global health today, it's not a bunch of more doctors and epidemiologists. Mm -hmm. We need people who understand finance. We need people who know how to structure deals. How do you structure an insurance scheme that will actually work in a country that has a lot of HIV or TB or malaria or um, uh, uh, too much poverty? And how do you structure payments? I mean, these are the things that are going to determine if we get to universal health coverage. And it's not going to be a bunch more doctors setting guidance or a bunch more epidemiologists finding a couple more cases here or there. So these issues you're raising are being done well. I actually, what we need to stop doing is us coming up with the solutions. I mean, the number of innovative finance solutions that will solve marginal problems but create enormous meetings and paperwork where the countries are trying to figure out, they're doing remarkable things. Like the Minister of Finance at Kenya was thinking about carbon tax credits to finance the health system. They're looking at insurance schemes. They're figuring out how to structure things in a way. They're, they're looking at loans and buy-downs and fascinating stuff, but we come up with these you know, simple little things and then go say, here, go use this, instead of saying, what are you doing and what could we do that would make a difference to you? And if we can't, get out of your way and just support what you're doing. So Just you know. come with this question, we will love you. <laughs> 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 and another example, to show that it has to be structured on the culture, the history, and the life of people. Yeah. Mutuelle de Santé is a community-based health insurance. Everybody told us we are crazy, we've never made it, it has never been done. Huh? It is done. 81% <laughs> of Rwandan population are covered by this health insurance. The rest are people like me who are covered by um, another type of insurance because we have a salary and we pay taxes and they take that our salary. So you just deal with the population. How can you recognize the poor among yourself? Village come together and identify three type of class. The first one pays zero. The government has to manage to find the money to pay for them. The premium and 10% at each point of care. The other one pays $5 per member of family and 10% and, and at point of care, all along the chain. And people like me, if I want to join, pay $12 per capita by my family member. And this works. And this is fresh money to put in the, the basket of health for everyone. And we just tell the people, you know, it's one beer or two beer or three beer per capita and per year. And everybody look at the people who drink beer and say, okay. <laughs> so we have money. We yep. just have to talk to the people and also express to them that the money will be protected. 
you yeah. think, Jake? Very, very quickly. I think that this conversation must also start from first deciding what you're offering the people. And I think that's mm -hmm. where most governments go wrong. Because they just say, we are going to do social insurance, but what are you offering with it? What are you covering it? So the importance of creating first an essential benefits package, then costing it, then moving towards strategic purchasing discussions. Then you get to strategic purchasing discussions and configuring what the premiums are, then you engage the community, as uh, uh, Dr. Agnes is saying. We are using community health workers who link the communities to the formal system, going house to house, having that conversation with the households, and many of the people there actually have money. They own motorbikes, they pay insurance for them. Why can't they afford to pay health premiums for themselves? Then the ones who are poor, identify them through socioeconomic data and hand them over to the government for subsidy. And it is working, and we are testing it now in Kenya. May? Um, I think, you know, Health insurance is going to be a critical factor, particularly when we look at expanding access to cancer treatment. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about unlocking the hidden value, and by that I mean ministries of health are already paying quite a lot of money, and so are individuals. So a lot of people go abroad for cancer treatment. They're spending a tremendous amount of money in other countries for cancer treatment. And I think one of the things about cancer treatment is that it has the potential to really destabilize this system of crowdsourcing treatment. So we see a lot of patients, they call Harambi, they get contributions from their family, but what we see is we're leaving behind a trail of bankruptcy behind a patient who has passed away because this care is very expensive relative to other things, but people's hope is eternal and people will absolutely do everything they can to get access to treatment. And so what we're seeing is a generation of sort of middle-aged people who are now bankrupt because they've been paying for treatment for their parents. And so I think health insurance is going to be a critical tool that we have to start protecting people um, and also allowing us to invest in, in health care for, for our people. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists. Thank you so much for all this insightful comments that you made. Let's give them all a round of applause, please. <laughs>